What up, though, Detroit? My name is Joel Fluent Green, and welcome to another another awesome edition of Pockets of Joy. Um, today's episode, we'll be talking about Mahogany, the legendary cafe Mahogany. This one is titled Mahogany to Infinity. Um, of course, Pockets of Joy is being brought to you by the Detroit Historical Society, where they tell the Detroit stories and why they matter. And also myself, Joel Fluent Green, and Joel Fluent Green Presents. Um, I'm, I'm jittery on the inside, because today, this is something that's really personal, and really close to my heart. I have people on this Zoom right now that I love dearly, that are friends, peers, people I've known for about 20 years plus, which is crazy. Um, these are people that I admire, I respect, and that have, doing, have done so many great things since Mahogany um, all around the world. And so we're gonna get into their history, get into the history of Cafe Mahogany, what it meant to all of us, because we are all people that were birthed from this place and has done so much for us. Um, so joining us today, uh, we have friends of mine, people that I care about deeply. My homeboy, DJ Invisible, Carl Olier is in the building. What up, Carl? What's up, brother? What's going on, Floyd? All is well? It. You got it. We got my homeboy, Mike E, in the building. Dope poet, um, actor, writer. It's amazing talent, man. Multi-talented, renaissance man, brother, right there. We also have my sister, the illustrious, award-nominated Dominique Morriso. I love Dominique so much. Um, playwright, writer. Um, just a brilliant mind who's done so many beautiful things. She has pretty much taken the torch and like just done everything with it since Mahogany. But I definitely want to get into how she's doing right now, what's going on um, as far as everything. And then we have my brother, Kari Turner, executive director of the Coleman A. Young Foundation, um, doing great things to find scholarships for the youth of the city of Detroit. Um, upstanding brother, awesome father, husband, somebody who I consider my mentor when it comes to poetry, real talk in the city of Detroit. He's one of my favorite poets. And at the, actually, at the end of this, we'll get to hear a poem by him, one of all of our favorite poems by this brother, which is like, the, it's like pretty much the, the definitive Cafe Mahogany poem, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> real. Agreed, so, agreed. And last but not least, my homegirl, uh, the reason why we're all together, that brought us all together to make this whole thing happen, representing Detroit Histor Historical Society to the fullest, uh, a Cafe Mahogany original, a brilliant mind. I've been having some great conversations with the sister lately. And um, I'm really growing such a great respect. I already respected her, but now I just, it's really nice to know how somebody's cut and what they're all about. And she's been doing some amazing work with the DHS. She'll tell you more about what they're doing, what they got planned. My sister, Malika Pryor. What up, Malika? How you doing? Hi, Fluent. <laughs> Good <laughs> greetings. Let's get into it. Let's make it happen. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited. I, and I think before we sort of got into the show, I, I, I mentioned that, I, that I'm relatively positive that this is the first time that all of us have been in the same space. And so of course I place that in heavy air quotes because we're living in a virtual space and hopefully we can bring this, this dialogue into a physical space very soon. Um, but it feels historic because quite frankly, there are young, yes, I said it, I call this young, um, but very much living and working luminaries, not just for the city of Detroit, but for the country and quite frankly, for the world. Um, and so while we're facing a pandemic that is you know, impacting the city of Detroit in, in, in a particular kind of way, it feels so fitting that this body of people are also going to be engaged in this conversation. So I'm really, really excited about it. Anytime I get into um, a conversation with the Detroiter, um, whether born um, and bred or, or a transplant or someone that moves into the city, um, I usually start the conversation with this question. And so I know that everybody isn't necessarily doing poetry on a regular basis. Maybe we, all of us aren't even creating poetry on a regular basis. Um, however, poetry brought us to this particular moment. And so I'm curious, what's your Detroit story? It can be a super hyper specific. It can be broad and chronological. It just can't be long and chronological. I, well, I'll say what brought me to poetry is early on. That's like Bates Academy education, you know, teachers that exposed me to, I think my eighth grade teacher exposed me to, um, no, I know my eighth grade teacher, uh, Dr. Willie Bell Gibson from Bates Academy. Big up to all the Bates brats. Um, she introduced me to Maya Angelou and her poem, specifically her poem, Still I Rise. And I, she made me do that in like the eighth grade, like our like black history show for the school, you know? And um, I connected to it. She, I had to do, I had to say the poem in front of the whole school, basically. And, um, and I got so affirmed by my teachers, by, the, by my classmates, 
you know, by everybody that I could perform this woman's poetry. Um, and it was, it was in contrast to the eighth grade boys who had Gwendolyn Brooks's poem, um, We Real Cool. And so I was, they were like four of them together, like a little crew saying that poem. And then I was by myself saying, still I rise. So I was like, you know, I felt kind of small. And it's sort of a metaphor for me in the poetry world that I feel like, even with my brothers right here, that I felt felt like the the girl among so many guys so often in poetry. And it started in eighth grade, you know? Um, And so to sort of have to feel like I'm holding my own with this woman's work, you know, uh, with all the boys that are kind of (laughs) hyper-puberty at that time, you know? Um, It was... It, it it made me feel kind of validated. Uh, and I felt like my Detroit community, sort of my, the elders in our community sort of lifted me up and said, this is something I think you have a penchant for. Writing poetry for her class was something, you know? Um, and I think that that's the first time I discovered it. And then I just feel like I kept rediscovering poets, poets and poetry in Detroit, particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like Detroit poetry saved my life, l- literally. And figuratively, you know, I, when I first discovered um, this concept that people wanted to hear poetry out loud, I just thought like, oh my God, there's a place <laughs> where like other people will come and listen to people's poetry. Because I was always writing poetry since I was a kid. And I would force, you know, my friends to sit in my room and listen to me, <laughs> like give my own little personal poetry readings. I, I had no idea that it could be funky and have DJs and have like people want to gather in the name of um so for me discovering discovering poetry again through my peers through effluent and through dj carl at cafe mahogany you know um i it just it shaped it shifted my life and made me feel relevant and valid as a voice in 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 our city but just and also in the world i'll go next um my uh what 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 brought me to um, Cafe Man- Cafe Mahogany really was hip hop. Um, I was I was in a rap group uh, called the Crew called Open Mic, and um, I'd come out of that hip hop shop Rhythm Kitchen era. I just moved back to the city after graduating college um, in, around '93, and um, by around '97, you know, my crew had started to go our separate ways. You know, some moved out of town, and uh, and I was left with a with a stack of songs that I had nothing to do with. And, and I was very much accustomed to, um, to spitting, performance, uh, being in front of audiences. And I had uh, a, a dear friend in Jessica Care Moore, who before moving to uh, Brooklyn, had really done her thing at a spot called Poor Me Cafe uh, in Detroit, uh, just, just, which preceded Mahogany. And I kind of thought about that and heard about Mahogany and decided on a whim to go down there and test out this song that I had written uh, that never got a chance to get recorded because we broke up. My crew broke up before we got a chance to get recorded. And I remember distinctly the first night that I walked in because I was in a real unsettled space. You know, I was I was that unsettled artist. I was occupying that space. And I walk in and this energy inside of Mahogany was electric. You know, everything was like dark and moody and sexy. And, you know, Carl was spinning, you know, and, and he and Fluin had this synergy that I had never seen before, even between, uh, you know, typical MCs and DJs, you know, and it was like, there was a dialogue between when, what Fluent would say on, what you <laughs> would say, you know, on stage and Carl, what, what you would say in response, uh, Uh, on the turntables. And I remember that night, I got extremely nervous because here I come walking in the door with this unsettled feeling and I, and I walk into this thing that just seems so cohesive and organic and, and the poetry was dope. And and there were a lot of cats uh, taking the stage who, in my opinion, sounded like they were actually reading a lot of, you know, and I was like, all right, this is just like frou-frou what's on my mind poetry. Some of these cats are like well-read and studied. And um mm-hmm. and I did I did the piece that you alluded to earlier at the top of the talk, fluent. I did the servants like nervous. And it was it was one of those moments where you know you the you see the the show on TV where the cat steps on stage and starts singing nervously, but then someone responds to it and then next thing you know the whole room is responding to it and all of a sudden um 
to borrow your word, Dominique, by the end of your piece, you're, you're affirmed. And I was hooked because after that piece, the room stood up and I was like, all right, I think I'm home. And, and I was at Mahogany every week, um, every, at least every week that I could be there um, for the next few years running. So Mike, I'm gonna turn to you at this moment and ask you to tell us your Detroit story or one of them that brought you to poetry. Well, there's two. One, I grew up in Virginia and um, a small but progressive city and my, my middle school was actually named Langston Hughes and, and our mascot, the Panthers. <laughs> Imagine that, Virginia. <laughs> um, I didn't really understand the gravity of it when I was a kid, but it was vandalized initially, broken windows, spray painted epithets on it. So that introduced me to Langston Hughes, even though we didn't even have curriculum around Langston Hughes. Um, like Kari, I connected to poetry through hip hop. All my family was from Queens, New York. I had cousins that were like DJs, graffiti artists. They could pop, they could break, they could do everything. I was a corny kid from Virginia trying to emulate. Um, I'll just fast forward though. I, I went to the University of Virginia and I, I worked in sports and I came to Detroit to work for a sports firm. I didn't know anybody really in Detroit. And a friend introduced me to Cafe Mahogany. And like Kari said, Invisible is up there spinning and flowing is flowing and they're back and forth and people are laughing and then people are clapping and snapping. I've never seen anything like this. I said, man, this is amazing. And then like, I said, all right, next time I come, I'm gonna try something. And I had on a suit. I came for work. People looking at me like, you <laughs> and I just, I was nervous. Like, I just put mic. And then I saw that there were like three other mics. So I just put E, you know, so to, to make some difference. Uh, and then that's like, mm -hmm. was like, oh, we got my man Mikey coming up. I'm like, oh, damn, he made me sound like somebody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and really, that was it. And I got to say, man, like, uh, Kari was and is the coldest poet, man. Like, yeah, wow. First thing, I'm getting chills now. I think about it. first thing, so. he came in starts with the moment of light of enlightenment. Now, uh, <laughs> servants like he takes you on this whole journey, and then like invisible would just play the perfect song after whoever spit, and it was either like always, always, always. always. one hundred. And I'm just like, how are they doing it? Like y'all were like shamans and me and magicians to me. And then like the next time I came, you know, I still had my suit on, but I loosened my tie. <laughs> <laughs> Third time, all right, you know, I kind of belong here. And that was really it, man. And, and it just introduced me to a whole new world, woke me up out of what I would call a creative coma. And yeah. people mm -hmm. like Fluent, Kari, Dominique, Invisible, all of y'all just kind of like embraced me, didn't throw any shade, made me feel part of something. And I really credit Mahogany with um, helping me become an artist, for sure. Carl, I know that you're not necessarily a poet, but I'm, I'm curious as to what brought you to poetry. As an actual uh, poet, not poet, I would be on the side of the stage next to that big, beautiful black piano. And as some poets were up there doing their thing, I would take on record sleeves and write the most ridiculous poetry ever <laughs> and just pass it to Joel. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when, when you say that, like, I always had a, a song to play for, like, the first hour before uh, we got ready to, you know, start the actual show, I'd be carrying crates and crates of records in to make sure that I had at least something that fit into everything so that I could hear the poets start to do their thing and then turn to the side and then, like, shuffle through the dig through the crates and then find a record and try and get to that one little bit of song that matched whatever they, they played. but. <laughs> Joe, I found some of those ridiculous record sleeves the other day. And I had to file them back away. <laughs> oh, man. You know, some, some of the poets that would come on stage, like, you know, the first time we saw Mike, Mike had on a suit. And then, you know, Joe and I would look at each other like, oh, this dude right here. And then after he spit the first time, we we're like, ah, much respect to you. <laughs> okay. <you know. laughs> right. Okay. All right. I see what you did there. And, you know, like you said, when, when certain poets would come up and you would see that they were like, okay, this person, like, put in some work, they actually made sentences and their phrases, and this person put some effort in, you know, those people, you would usually get songs played that were, like, respectful of the craft. 
uh, after <laughs> certain movies came out, people's poetry, they, they came in for a different reason. There'd yeah. be guys that would come yeah. into the poetry house and their whole goal was to try and match. And their poems would be kind of, you know, like, dude, you didn't put any effort in. Like, you remember those old Motown songs where, like, somebody sat down and wrote a song from start to finish. It was beautiful and had meaning. Then as R&B progressed, it was, hey, girl, you're going to come over here and be my woman. And, you know, they just fell <laughs> off to what we kind of what we have now. Poetry was the same kind of way. Poetry, poets would come in and they would be super eloquent and there would be a reason uh, to what they were saying. I'm sorry, I'm being attacked by my border collie here. And then it, it got to a point where some of the men, the male poets, and even some of the female poets would come up with poems that were just like straight to the point. Hey, girl, I want you to come over here, sit next to me. I'm going to buy you a drink. You going home with me. Oh, yeah. And the people would clap for it. And I'd be like, oh, no, I've got the perfect song for this right here. <laughs> so, I mean, that Cafe Mahogany era in poetry to me is so many things in life now just click in and remind me of certain situations that were there. So I, Cafe Mahogany, let's see, going back to the original question. I came home from college in 96, and one of my friends was running Cafe Mahogany. He asked me if I wanted to spend this Tuesday night poetry uh, event. I was like, yes, of course. And then it just turned into like the greatest networking, uh, lifelong friendship building place that I've yeah, ever been in. So, you know, I've toured the world with Mike. You know, Kari and I are in an awesome band that has kind of like on a sabbatical at any moment in time will reform like Voltron. Yeah. Fluent and I are just like, you know, brothers for life. You know, this is. Mrs. Pryor, Dominic, you guys, you know, we were, I was supposed to be in New York last week watching your play. Like I, the, know. Um, I know. I was a chaperone for my son Phoenix's school, and we were all excited. And I was like, I know yeah. Dominique. We she made this whole thing happen. Right. We, she made we this whole thing happen. You know? yeah. So, yeah. yeah it's just, it's just a, a wonderful place. And it's just, I'm so happy to have been a part of it that I have these lifelong friends that came out of that place. Fluent as the other half of that team of Magi, um, or, the, or the Magi duo um, who, who, would, who really did create this very perfect sort of energy. Because I feel like at one point, Carl, you were like on the opposite side of the stage at one point. And I felt like there was this sort of communication that created, I don't know, like some sort of infinity across the two of you. And you did literally 100% of the time have the perfect song. Um, Fluent, what brought you to poetry? I'm like Kari, um, like Mike, people like that. Like hip hop brought me to poetry. Um, you know, I was the kind of guy that was working like at Northland and I would catch the Dexter or the Hamilton bus downtown. <laughs> I go to St. Andrews, you know what I'm saying? I go to Mahogany, I go to, the, I, I used to search out these places because back then, open mics were open mics. If you found open mic, you're trying to do poetry, you're trying to rap, you're trying to do something because they were like so far in between, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I just took advantage of the vibe. And then, um, you know, I was like 19 years old, just going down there by myself, learning the bus system while I'm trying to enter this scene, you feel me? Uh, mm -hmm. So then Mahogany, when I, it, it, just, it changed my life. I mean, I, I went to this place and I've never experienced a vibe like that before. You know, I, I didn't come from a sophisticated background as far as like, you know, I'm 19 years old. Like, what do I know? My dad's a jazz musician. I grew up with cool stuff. But at the same time, I had never experienced anything like that. So that was like my introduction to like real adulthood. You know what I'm saying? That was my introduction to the arts. Um, so then like even after me, like just going, you know, signing open mic list, being a part of that whole vibe, you know, because I wasn't the original host. When I first went, there was a sister hosting and I cannot remember her name. Then after her, Lester, y'all remember Lester, he was hosting. And then I took over after Lester. So I was like the third host in that row because Zaina and Corey asked me to host. And I said, yeah, of course I'll host. You know, it was, it was like the job to have back then. And I just kind of held it with an iron fist. I was like, oh, I like this. This is fun, you know, because it was a whole nother thing. And, I, you know, back then, it's funny. I always considered that, I always thought that my entrance into the artistic world, as far as anything of any note, would be hip hop. I didn't think it would be poetry. Now, I love being a serious. Mm. I love learning form. I love teaching. I love being ingrained in this. this I'm self-taught because back then, it was cast like Mike E, like Kari. I looked at it as being like the real poets. Dominique, you know, um, people like y'all, y'all were the real poets, you know, to me. Back then, I was like the goofy hip hop guy having fun with Carl 
and I would have my little poems, and I had a couple of little things, but I didn't have no like mahogany classics. I had a poem about Esther Bro. Remember it? Dumbo. <laughs> <laughs> I had a poem about uh, Aaron Neville, and he had that mole. Remember? And like, uh, yeah, oh my Aaron God! Neville, I remember poem. that poem. But, but yo, it's so dope. He come you, to mahogany? you had a dope poem dedicated to your sister that I still remember. And it was this mm. repetitive, you beautiful baby, you beautiful baby shine. I remember that, yeah. I remember that poem too. Wow. Yeah. And that was, like, what was cool, again, like, y'all, for me, I'm from Virginia, and I'm new to Detroit. And this, the D is the D, especially in the 90s. But y'all were able to create this balance where, like, you had, you know, you had thugs up in there like, yeah, man, I was, t you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was that balance. Dominique, I, again, like, Detroit has its own lingo, right? Yeah. It's the first time I'm hearing Dominique break down the lingo. She was talking about squall, and that was both. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, I, I got to look this stuff. I ain't heard this slang. You know what I'm saying? I'm going East Coast. So it was, y'all had this whole cultural education that you gave us, man. It, it was dope. Back then, it was like, you know, it was the poetry scene, but it was people like Slum Village was coming through. Yeah. Boy, well, like, Common. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Common came, yeah. Common, the yeah. roof, uh, Q tip, uh, mm -hmm. all the tribes. From speech I think. from a rest development. Speech from yeah. Arrest yeah. Arrest. I remember that. I remember that. I remember, yeah. Hey, you know, y'all remember? It's funny Girl. listening to y'all talk about like hip hop and poetry, like how you guys were all brought to poetry through hip hop. And I'm sorry for when I realized I cut you off. I'm gonna let you have that in a minute. But like the the hip hop element of poetry for me, I was the one that was not coming from hip hop. I was coming from poetry. I was coming from mm -hmm. like studying it and writing it and re reading Langford Hughes and Co County Cullen and Claude McKay and being a nerd in English class. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like be, especially if it was black literature being a super nerd about poetry and coming to uh, this world where people were coming from the hip hop, you know, influence and, and bringing that. It was always interesting because you always, you know, it was like, we would joke that, um, uh, I would joke with friends like, you know, MCs is hiding out in poetry spots, <laughs> try out they rap. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, this is like, well, Mahogany had like hip hop night on Wednesdays to go to, mm -hmm. or Wednesday or Thursday, something like that, right? Yeah. Like they had other yeah. nights, and I would, I would, I started date MCs, uh, you know, and my husband's an MC, you know. Like I feel like it, it the the uh, my collaboration with different kind of hip hop artists with poetry, like that started, you know, how like Jessica was working with to live and whatnot, you know, just like this idea of hip hop and poetry and poets connecting and vibing. That was something that I think you guys, your influence, brought into the world of poetry for me, and mm. turned my poetry to be able to hear poetry from um, in a different way, like a, a different pentameter than a rap song, but still have hip hop poetry. That was something I got introduced to through Mahogany mm. and that influenced my writing. You know what I'm saying? Heavily, heavily. I was like mm. a kid, like, like a sponge, like, oh, like, so, like I felt like I had to come every week because my there was a moment at the very beginning of Mahogany where like writers were elevating me like in, intensely, you know? Mm. And I would have to come back every week with like a new way of looking at my craft every week, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I was, that's so dope that that happened. I know, funny, we we're, were talking about people who had been to Mahogany, and I was oh. gonna say, Carl, remember the time that the dad from um, The Smart Guy came? Remember that TV show, The Smart Guy? Yes, it was like, yes. And he was like, oh, like, hey, I'm the dad from The Smart Guy. Everybody bowed down to me, remember? And he got on the mic and said something. He's like, yeah, you guys could be like me one day, remember? <laughs> What? That was, that, that, the coolest part about Mahogany, one of the, excuse me, one of the cool parts about Mahogany, it was a humbling place. It was. Celebrities would come yeah. into Mahogany and everybody is in their own vibe, paying attention to the, the, the MC or the poet on stage. And when you, make, when you stepped on that stage, everyone was focused on you. I remember one day Jermaine Dupree walked in and everybody looked up like, hmm, Jermaine Dupree. Don't care if somebody's on stage right now. <laughs> and he was mind blown away. He was his entire trip to Detroit that Tuesday was blown away because after a Friday night, Jermaine Dupree, after being humbled Tuesday at Cafe Mahogany, walked into Mediterranean Cafe. We were sitting there having a late dinner after one night. He walked to the front of the line and I, I'm next. I'm Jermaine Dupree. And everybody looked at him like, Man, and we 
you know, I cracked up. We're like, oh, round number two, Detroit is humbling somebody. You know, so many people came through the Detroit doors during everybody. that time. And it was just, whatever. If you're not on stage, we're focused on the artist on stage right now. You know, right. Get in where you fit in. This is what's going on in this building right now. We made our own celebrities out of that, that Tuesday night. I agree. There was a... Um, there was there was definitely um, a culture within those walls, you know. Yeah. And when you walked in, uh, you felt it. I remember. I don't know why this this particular night has always struck me, uh, stuck with me, because it wasn't anything like momentous. But I remember going to Mahogany on a Tuesday night, the day that Lauren Hill's album dropped. Um, mm -hmm. The Miseducation of Lauren Hill had just been released. Remember back then, albums were released on Tuesdays. Yeah. And I walk in. They sure were. Dominique, yeah. you were sitting by the window singing X Factor at the top <laughs> of your lungs. And you were just sitting there like, care for me, care for me, you know that? <laughs> and I just walked in like, yo, this joint just came out today. And she like knows the entire record. <laughs> and for some reason, that just struck me like, no, oh, these Negroes here are like really serious about <laughs> this vibe, you know, this thing. Because of course, you know, that album represented, in a, in a sense, everything that Mahogany was about, you know, culturally, yeah. spiritually, um, blah, 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 blah. So I knew that I was walking into a spot where it was, it was a hot day for music releases, you know, in that, yeah. in that community, you know? But yeah. I, didn't, I didn't expect to walk in and see, like, that people had picked it up, absorbed it, walked to, gone to Mahogany and started to apply that feeling that, mm -hmm. that came from that music. And I was like, wow, this is an extension of the same feeling that we experience and try to apply every week, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why that story, that, why that visual has always stuck with me. Um, because you really were in a different, in a different world and in a, in a different class of talent when you, when you stepped in there. We would go there and dissect whatever happened during the week, you know, so the, mm -hmm. from the week before we talk about that then there. I remember like when the love movement came out, the tribe album, we talked about that there. Mm -hmm. um, the breakup album. Yeah, like, you know, um, long, I remember that exact day. I remember yeah. exactly what you're talking about. That was, a, that was a great day at Mahogany, I remember that. Because that mm -hmm. album definitely was definitive of that time, for real. Yeah. Wow. It was a definitive album, and it's one of the best albums. Well, that's my, that's my humble opinion. I agree. Um, but Joel, so, so I, I realize, I recognize, and I completely respect that you were not the first nor the only host but i do think of you as the forever host mm -hmm. of mahogany and there are all these wonderful stories obviously that have just been sort of organically flowing from from all of our guests but i'm wondering um before we sort of move into a different direction do you from the perspective and lens of host have a favorite memory or a memory that you found to be definitive and there are probably more than one so i'm okay with you just picking one of purely from the hosting standpoint my highlight, like as a hip hop fan, as a poet, as a host, uh, my highlight was when Common and mm -hmm. Black Talk were freestyling. And mm -hmm. I'm in the middle. And this was not a poetry night. This was just another night. It might have been a hip hop night, but I was there. So I was always, that was Friday. The Friday. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I was there. You know, I would, I would come hang out. If Carl was DJing, I would come support. If Lazy was doing something, I'd come. So shout out to Lazy Body, man, by the way. Shout Spain. out to Lazy. Carl sure. Shaw, Cyrus, all these. These are the people, Curtis. They're the ones that brought this thing to us. And um, yeah, so I would go support whatever. But one night I went, it was a Friday night, like Carl said, and they had a whole thing. So I was blessed enough to be able to host this one uh, short period of time. I believe Billy T was there that night too, I think. But I was able to host for a minute when Black Thought is on one side of me from the roots, Black Thought, like the guy Black Thought, like that MC still. Top five. Yeah. My top, top five. five, you hear me. Okay, yeah. sorry. Top three for me. Yeah. Top three for me. I'll put down the t shirt. And then, uh, <laughs> and then up to the other side, we got Common, who for me, being a regular dude from the Midwest, from Detroit, you know, Midwest slang, Midwest leaning, learning, Common was like that guy. You know what I'm saying? Before the dad rap, Common. Common was like hard. <laughs> Common. You know, dad rap. <laughs> Common was a top tier MC for real. Like, honestly, if someone said. Yeah, common sense, right? Before the common sense, right? Before to get before he dropped the sense, he was common, right? Mm -hmm. um, so um, it was an amazing time, and I just remember that, like, wow, this is like I could die right now, and my my host dreams have been fulfilled. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because 
I'm actually literally facilitating this whole freestyle thing, and it was a beautiful moment. Um, and then, of course, when speech came for Arrested Development, that was that was hot. That was dope. That was dope. That was dope. I yeah, that was that. Like, he kicked it with everybody. You know what I'm saying? He wasn't like superstar status there. He was just there chilling. He performed. He was encouraging. I got the freestyle with him. Um, and that was beautiful. I thought I was gonna get a record deal off of that. I was like, oh, this is my life. I'm about to, it's about to pop off. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of development is about to put me on, right? That's what I did. And so um, it was just a monumental, like there's so many stories. I mean, I guess those are two, but I have so many stories. All of you all since Mahogany have gone on to expand and amplify your work. Um, particularly around the power of word and of, of the word. And so I, I find it incredible how Mahogany ends up being for most of you sort of this quintessential or your quintessential Detroit story that brings you to poetry. But then where does Mahogany take you um, after that? Um, and kind of what have you been doing since? I mean, because I mean, obviously there's Afroflow, there's Black Bottom Collective, and I'm gonna let everybody identify themselves accordingly. You know, there's Obie Awards and, you know, MacArthur Genius Award. I mean, there is a body of brilliance that's sitting on this call um, that I don't think people quite realize because I can say, oh, you're the executive director of so-and-so, or you're the actor here, or you're a playwright and producer. You all have been doing, I mean, just, there's just this trajectory, right? That's one. Um, which is 19 years of just incredible work. And so wow. I'm just, where did, where, you know, post Mahogany or at that moment where you realized or Mahogany began to make a shift or you began to grow, wh whatever took place, where did Mahogany take you and what have you been doing since? And so Mike, I'm gonna bring you into the conversation here. I was working for a sports firm in, in sports marketing and PR, and which would have really been a dream job. Shout out to Joe Dumars. He was one of the clients we worked with, really cool cat. Um, and it was a dream job, but I was miserable because I didn't like being on someone else's time. And then I saw this whole freedom of expression that through Cafe Mahogany and uh, the Detroit Repertory Theater. Shout out to Harold Hogan, an incredible actor and instructor who beat COVID, thank God. Oh. Um, and so between, yeah, I hope you see this because that man saved my life. Um, mm -hmm. Between those two, it gave me the confidence to go into music um, create a platform called Afro Flow, flowing from Africa, reminding people about the roots of hip hop and humanity, release songs in Ethiopia where I was born that helped us to build clinics and reintroduce me to the country, to see kids coming out of the river behind me, the Nile River singing my song. Mickey number one. I'm on my mm -hmm. here <laughs> from that, but Cafe launched that, Cafe Mahogany launched that. Um, film incentives came to Michigan. And so I've been able to do a dozen films and television shows from Detroit, um, working with a number of nonprofits using music and live production as a platform to engage communities. Shout out to you, Malika Pryor, for making Afroflow a part of the Charles H. Wright Museum, which became an annual thing, and that was your vision. Um, it allowed me to partner with nonprofits, Invisible and I toured for years with the American Cancer Society using music as a platform to uh, raise cancer awareness and tobacco cessations. We go, we crisscross high schools, hospitals, cafes, clubs, coliseums, the projects, First Nation reservations. We have kids come on stage and exchange cigarettes for CDs on stage. Mm. Gang members giving us their rags after shows. Little girls who were cutting would exchange their razors. And again, that relationship with Carl came through you know what I'm saying? Through, through mahogany, um, man, it's so many. It's it's so many other things, and you know, it really is like public speaking. Really, is the number one phobia of people. And I had done certain things in public before, but never in a city like Detroit, where I don't know anybody, and you got cold people up there like Kari and Dominique and Jessica and other people. And then so to, it it validated that I at least had something to say. I could contribute. You know what I mean? And so it was definitely a launching pad. It gave me the confidence to go into these other areas and, and just kind of marry artistic aspirations with um, compassion for community and, and um, executive skills and marry all of that. I think, I think the beautiful thing about uh, Mahogany is that it did, um, Carl mentioned this earlier, it breeded these like lifelong friendships and, and brotherhood, sisterhood, right? And, you know, even, even on this call, you know, I'm, I'm 
virtually surrounded by, you know, lifelong friends. Uh, and, and I think that was the first out, outgrowth. Um, uh, it, it also, you know, became a thread, as you suggested, Malika, you know, because, you know, words in one way or another have kind of woven, you know, through my life, you know. Um, I, again, you know, I came to Mahogany, a disgruntled hip hop artist, and I found uh, the, the first members uh, in, in Carl and Kamal, uh, who played bass at Mahogany, um, besides my wife, you know, the first members of Black Bottom Collective, um, which ended up making the most significant musical impact on my life, impact on my life of, of any other endeavor I'd been involved in, you know, uh, so that was, that was an eight man hip hop collective. We were a mashup and we, we, you know, we blended styles and recorded two albums together um, and, and rocked hard, you know, uh, with each other uh, for uh, just over a decade. And um, I, you know, I, you know, we, we started families, you know, it, you know, while we were a part of that collective and, you know, raised our, started raising our babies, you know, during that time. And, you know, uh, some of us became entrepreneurs, some of us, you know, in Carl's case, you know, toured the world. And, um, and then, you know, for me, uh, I also kind of became the, I don't know, call me the method man or the red man to Mike's method man or red man, you know, <laughs> Um, Mike became one of my best friends and, and remains that, you know, and, uh, you know, our brotherhood has just been a blessing uh, to, to my life and, and all my family. Um, and, and then uh, professionally, I just never stopped doing what I was doing. You know, I was always a writer. Uh, I was, you know, I started writing for The Source and Double XL and was always interested in covering hip hop and, and telling people stories. You know, I was always an entertainment and features writer. Um, but but because of the confidence that Mahogany gave me, um, just by chance, I ended up writing a piece that influenced one of hip hop's most seminal B-side records in Ten Craft Commandments, uh, which ended up influencing three records on the Hamilton soundtrack. Um, and I'm proud to say that I was a minor contributor to both of those projects, you know, um, and to, to attach my name to those things is... Uh, that's been impactful, you know, for me, uh, for my family. Um, and, and then uh, later on, I ended up going back into the nonprofit sector and, and became executive director at Coleman and Young Foundation. And my greatest passion of the last 15 years has been to take care of the ones who got next, you know, make sure that these babies have an opportunity to get to college, to get mentoring while they're there, um, to get ready for life after high school, whether they are you know, headed toward college or the workforce. Um, I took that position thinking I would like it and end it, and I ended up loving it, you know? So, uh, you know, storytelling is a big part of what I do there, you know? So again, the word is influential in what I do. And then, you know, the, the, the biggest accomplishment of my life, you know, is, is, you know, beyond all that, just being a husband and a father. And, and 22 years, I was engaged when I walked into Mahogany. I was always the poet who signed up early, I would always, you know, Del Fluorn or anybody who was working on this, put me on in the first half, because after <laughs> 11 o'clock, I'm going go. home, I'm smelling Joel, like smoke. I, I, that? Much. I was saying, Joel, so when Joel and I were sort of prepping for this, I shared, I think, Joel, you shared a, really it's probably my first real memory of Mahogany, and it was actually watching you, Kimani, perform, and then, and you said, okay, now I gotta go home to my wife, and I was like, mm -hmm. yo, like that, <laughs> poets talk that's about wives. Why? <laughs> I, I used to laugh about it, but I was dead serious. I, I asked my wife to marry me like a couple weeks before I discovered mahogany, and wow. I was just like, "Yo, I'm not messing this up." You know, I got a good one, and um, so I was spit early and bounced because first of all, the women at mahogany were drop dead gorgeous. You know, I mean, that was that was like cowrie shell and short haircut era. You know. <laughs> That was like black my, is beautiful. The oh black is God. beautiful explosion. Oh my God. Yeah, so like, yeah, so it's like I couldn't stay too long. You know, I'm I'm a real Scorpio, so I I knew my limits <laughs> and I knew my strengths. So um I would bounce, you know, but twenty two years later, you know, I'm 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 still, you know, happily with that woman. We have a beautiful son. And um, you know, uh mahogany really did influence, you know, the course of my life from there. Cafe Mahogany gave me uh the, the people that are on this this stream right here have all influenced me in some shape, form, or fashion in taking my talents to another level. Um, 
touring with Mike is one of the coolest experiences that I've ever had. Mike will make sure that you're on time. And he has the saying, that <laughs> if you're on time, you're late. And I, for years, I was like, no, Mike, if you're on time, you're on time. And he's like, no, if you're on time, you're, you're late. And I was like, I, I don't understand that. That doesn't comprehend. <laughs> but after tour with Mike, I make sure that I'm, I'm always a little early, like even on this call today. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, uh, for what? This, today is a very monumental day in my existence because I was one minute before Mike doing something. <laughs> but so, but the, the confidence, so on stage, so we would be doing, uh, you know, rehearsals for shows. And my thing was always, one of my idols as a turntablist was Terminator X. And Terminator <laughs> X didn't do anything on stage other than rock, super awesome cuts, but he was a stoic person on stage. And Mike would tell me, you know, he would, his energy, you know, he would turn around and look at me and get into it. And I was like, oh, okay, oh, I'm into it. I didn't start screaming and hollering on the microphone until I started touring with Mike. That mm -hmm. elevated my performances with the exhibit tours. And when I was doing my own stuff, my call and response got so much tighter mm -hmm. touring with Mike. Touring with Kari, Kari and Tunisia would tease me because I would have the same basic cuts, the same scratch noises that I would use because I was comfortable with them. The two of them would have, you know, Carl, you got to, you know, expand, expand your cuts and, you know, do something different. And, you know, it was just being on stage with them helped me out a whole lot technically and with my call and response. Now, before I had an opportunity to tour the world with Mike and to tour and record, with, with Kari and Black Bottom Collective, Joel opened up my eyes with comedy and entertaining value on stage. Sure, Joel sure. was the most, like, to this day, I, I'm able to do certain things on stage without turntables, looking back and thinking about Joel's performances on stage. So when you have one person who walks up on stage, and is not a trained comedian, he's not you know, That's coming true. up to do a comic routine. <laughs> but when you're thrown in front of some people and you just My have to be on. Yeah. When you just have to be on, there is an art to that and there's a science to it. I, I thank you, Joel, so often when you don't even know it. When I'm put in situations it's like, and do something. And you're like, oh, oh <laughs> here it comes. <laughs> you know, I love that about, you know, it's just there's certain situations that I've been in that, that um, I would not have the opportunity, or I would not have the opportunity or the, the ability to do had it not been for my lifelong friends that are on this call right now. So currently, um, I tour with the State Department as a United States Music and Cultural Ambassador, which yes. uh, the, the, yeah, the State Department is, is the weirdest thing to say as a hip hop DJ, because the, the, the rooms that I'm in and the calls that I'm on, I'm talking to, you know, train thespians and train musicians and i'm a hip-hop dj from detroit michigan who went to king high school in detroit went to eastern michigan university yeah. and graduated from the university of cafe mahogany friendships to <laughs> be able to travel the world and represent the united states of america for scratching records and you know talking about hip-hop um you know I've, I tour with exhibits really still, you know, you know it's, I, I have so many cool opportunities internationally, not necessarily in Detroit anymore, but internationally because of the confidence that I gain working with my friends at Cafe Mahogany, so. I'm the forever DJ to the forever host of Cafe Mahogany. Um, where did it take you? I mean, Mahogany actually, you know, it gave me the confidence, like being around these people that I admired so much that were really the, the definitive poets, like Dominique said, she was studying poetry before she even stepped into Mahogany. So it really taught me to step my, my stuff up, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, like back then, you know, I knew I had talent, but I didn't really see myself as a poet or see myself as a serious person, I think. You know, I was just learning life. And so then over the years, you know, Mahogany gave me that initial confidence to really tackle life. And then, you know, going into fatherhood, going into uh, spaces with nonprofits, you know, hosting things with organizations, things like that. Um, I never thought it would happen. Mahogany opened my eyes to all of this. I was just hosting a poetry show once a week. You know what I'm saying? And it turned into this whole thing. I did a commercial with DJ Invisible, we did a co-commercial. Remember that? We were getting checks. Oh, like yeah, I remember that. And then since then, you know, went to Chicago, came back, 
And I was kind of like in a lost place. I was like, well, what, do I, what do I do? I don't have mahogany anymore. You know, when I came back from Chicago, mahogany was closed. Um, they had the Rhythm Cafe, but it was a different vibe. And I was still trying to find my footing in a city that I felt like, I felt like things kind of left me behind a little bit. You know, I didn't really know where I was. This was like early 2000s. Um, so then after that, you know, I really got confident. I was like, you know what, I'm here. I got to make the most out of it. I really started to get into my hip hop more. I released a couple of CDs. Um, really started working. Harmony Girl is still one of my favorite CDs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I think of the with that. So for there, I was at a music hall for about four years, working in education. And we did, uh, I facilitated uh, workshops at different schools all around the city. Because of music halls, I was able to go into about over 50 schools around the city of Detroit, teaching poetry. Outside of Inside Out, I've probably taught more poetry in the city of Detroit, like outside of like within the school. That's, you know, I'm not a teacher, you know, but outside facilitation, that sort of thing. I've probably been in like more schools, you know. Um, and because of that, you know, Mahogany just really opened up my life to that. I didn't think I'd be teaching anybody anything. Mm. Saying, like real talk, I'm not a good student. I'm a high school dropout. This is real talk. Mm. So, this is real, this is honest. And I was not yeah. a good student. I was not a studied person. I wasn't a learned person. I didn't really know anything um, about poetry. Uh, but then I started to read, you know, I started to really study. I really started to perfect my craft and take myself seriously and apply what I learned from life into my work. Um, so now, like for instance, you know, I, I, I keep the things going here. I feel like, you know, I, I pay poets. You know, I have slams that are successful. Um, I have. <laughs> These are going to change now. I mean, the, the, the way my events look before Corona, it's going to be a different vibe now. And I'm prepared for that. You know, I have to do things like this. We have to facilitate in different ways and reach the people in different ways. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you know, I'm up for the challenge. Mahogany gave me confidence. It, it gave me peers like these people right here that showed me a lot and taught me a lot. You had people who were artists. Maybe none of us were really trained and understood contracts, business, punctuality, professionalism. But we yeah. learned it. Learn it. We married that to our craft and it facilitated yeah. other things. And we're, it, it's different now because one viral video can change somebody's life, but for the vast majority of artists, it doesn't. So you still have to learn some of the things that you don't like to do so you right. can do what you love to do. And so many people out of Cafe Mahogany, we taught each other. Kari always giving you professional game. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I've moved into playwriting and then television writing and all those things. But my, um, my 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 agents are hitting me up like you know poetry is uh starting to boom do you have any poetry <laughs> and oh, i was like wow. do i have some poetry you know <laughs> i have this I'm glad um, it's a your agent said that that's cool just so you mean i could put out that chapbook from like 1999 that i never did you know <laughs> that that kari wrote the forward for <laughs> that i never did wow. anything with. um but i if i I I did move into poetry when I went to New York and I started slamming a lot and um and, and a little bit of that did kill the vibe for me. You know, I also missed the Detroit community that I came from, even though I felt I, I started to move into a Harlem community and, and work. I used to I lived in Brooklyn, but I would go slam in Harlem to win fifty dollars a week so I could pay some of them, you know, some of them bills. And then uh and then I went from that and I started writing plays. You know, and I wrote plays in college, but when I um, when I first started being like getting to be known in New York, I did a whole bunch. Of, I did a lot of things in New York City. Moving out there, Jessica, I think Jessica Caremore had lived in Brooklyn, and then she had moved to Atlanta by the time I got to New York. You know, and so I felt like I was like following in all these like spaces that she had been, uh, and then I started to find other spaces. You know, and um, and I think playwriting for me became a serious thing because I was all, I went to school for acting I was very much into theater and uh and I found myself as a playwright through poetry so in the very in the fashion of Intozaki Shange you know I had written my first choreo poem in college um that folks from the D came up and saw you know so my, me and yeah. Lord came to see you we came yeah. from D I remember, I was like, Fluent came up to see the show in college. I think I got video footage of that from like my dad. He like wow. takes everything. Um, but it like, it went from that to like me writing plays in New York to just kind of doing 101 things. And, um, and when I finally got my first production, like my first professional production in New York, it was because I started to, to write about Detroit again. 
you know. Um, I wanted to write in much in the fashion of August Wilson and what he's done for Pittsburgh. I wanted to do that for Detroit. When I would read August Wilson's work and be like, damn, like he, the people of Pittsburgh must feel so loved when they read this man's work because he captured like who they are and their essence. I want to do that for Detroit because I love the shit out of Detroit, you know? Um, and so I was able to, I started writing three plays about Detroit, one about the Detroit 67, which became part of the Detroit 1967 exhibit through the uh, Detroit Historical Society. Um, when we brought it home to the D word, you know? I, I, I wrote a play called Paradise Blue that was about Paradise Valley that I learned about from Paradise, the poet, from Cafe Mahogany. Wow. He used to do this poem. Wow. I had never heard of it before he started doing poetry about it. Um, you know, and so then I brought that play, I did that play in New York, and then I brought that play home to Detroit where Kari uh, gave us some beautiful Black Bottom, obviously Black Bottom Collective, this Thank play you. is called Black Bottom, and, and Kari and Black Bottom door. Collective. We got to vibe, he got to open my show with it. We got to open my show with his music. Um, that was awesome. It was so awesome. Hungry. And it was directed by Goldie Patrick, another homegirl, Cafe Mahogany girl, cast tech girl oh, like me. Yeah. You know? Um, and then I got to do my play Skeleton Crew about the auto industry. I did that in, uh, in uh, New York. And then I did it, I brought it back to Detroit. We had Ella Joyce from the D um, who came and starred in that. So I've been able to bring my work back home. I've been able to tell Detroit stories on stages in, across the country. Um, and I've been able to do it in New York. I'm doing it on Broadway. Well, you know, when there was a Broadway, before Broadway got shut down a month ago, I yeah. had my musical, you know, um, Ain't Too Proud about the temptation. And, and come on, salute. Now. Come on, come on. Listen, my brothers here came and saw the show. And like, I, I've been able to partner. Like, Mike came out, Fluent came out for me. Carl was supposed to, you know, before Corona. And I got my Temptations jacket just in honor of you, Don. <laughs> I can't stand you. <laughs> but um, what has been important for me has been able to, I've been able to go out into the world and, um, and come back home. And I get to come home through the people that still have a relationship with home, not just my family my blood family, but this family right here on this thread, you know, all of you, every last one of you, including you, Malika, has helped me come home in the way that feels right and organic to me um, and keeps me, my feet rooted in my city, even though now I'm living off and now I'm in LA, you know, and now even though I'm living out here, trying to tell Detroit stories out here in Hollywood, um, I want to make myself the person in theater and film and television that if you're talking about Detroit, you better come talk to me. If it's not me, I can tell you who you need to be talking to. But mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we're, um, th we are included in the narrative around our city, you know? And that we are not, you know, somebody not going to come shoot something in Detroit and there wasn't no Detroiters involved. Like, I'm not, that's what I'm not here for. There's no more perfect pocket um, to close this particular episode with than service like. This is the signature, my signature joint, um, the one that I walked in nervous. <laughs> and um, it's about it's about a planned slave revolt, um, servant's life. The pregnant pause was required before you spit your poem, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that old servant's life used to sit up there. Oil lamp in the window for the field slave's prayers. He wasn't no soothsayer, instead he would pose. Y'all know, front for massa, cook food and wash clothes and get with that, no sir, yes sir, come again? He had massa thinking he was the servant's only friend in the world, whole wide. He let him think that until nighttime, but when he went to bed, that's when that light shined. You see, that was the signal for this crew of field slaves to sneak to caves far away, rendezvous. Parlez-vous revolution. They had this plan to cause confusion and overthrow the man and the land. Now that's one real good plan, but Massa gonna scan this plantation if he suspect the sneaky situation. So those brothers kept a step up. Creative was their nature. They talked with this fervent servant and let him be the infiltrator. So he learned Massa moves. Knew when he was being happy. Knew when he was being shrewd, knew all his attitudes. So when the time was right, 
And Massa felt all right. The servant listened for that, didn't I? And then he lit that lamb bright. See, these are arts of war. You study your oppressor for you swing, then score. Because once you hit, you don't want him round no more. You got to keep your game tight. And if something ain't right, spark a servant's light. Now, that oil lamp in the window signaled to go ahead. Big Jacob from the field moved calm as the dead. Wake up. It's time to go. Wake up. Stay low. First one of y'all talk, gonna talk to this knife point. And so they kept an eye upon that oil lamp flashing. Plantation mashing fades from sight, dash into the woods, sprint a half mile into the thick, slow up just to catch your breath, but then resume that kick seat as cave rests up on a mountain, halfway up the hill. Take a couple sisters, hit to the deal, nobody talk. Leave the children with the elders in the still of the night so we can plan freedom by faith. Are we willing to fight? See, y'all hit to this agenda. Follow Baba's command. Keep a prayer in your heart, but machete in hand. Light a fire in this cave and check the area well, God willing. We about to raise some hell. Focus up. These are all arts of war. You study your oppressor for you swing, then score, because once you hit, you don't want him round no more. You got to keep your game tight. And if something ain't right, spark a servant's light. Time kept by North Star. With no rollies, no bull of a secret language, West African. Speak Yoruba. Keep a language for my brother from Ghana. Baba, would you start us with a prayer offered to the most high? No lie. Father, we all won't see this place fry. I seen so much death, I think I tear blood when I cry. I even seen folk die before they take their last breath. Because once they get your mind and your spirit, that is the real death. So we going to step strong. Hmm. Cold for something gone wrong is three shovels in the air and the singing of a song. And ain't nobody going to know when it's time to overthrow this. Because my brother with that deep voice going to sing. Go down, Moses. Hmm. Then we move like kings. Small front, small group take the front, large group take the rear. Handicap the mansion, stump the overseer, and know that we can die doing this. So when you swing, you swing like you got bombs in your fist. See, I'd rather die fighting than live crawling. I ball for all mm -hmm. these cats coming later on, hollering, yes, yes, y'all. Shows you born, I ain't gonna have them living like this. I only hope that they remember all their ancestors' risks in these arts of war. You study your oppressor for you swing, then score. Because once you hit, you don't want him round no more. You got to keep your game tight. And if something ain't right, spark a service. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Man, that's so cold, bro. It's still a message for right now. Make that a message for right now. Uh, it's like, bro, I went back to the story you paint in the poem and back to Cafe Mahogany. I was transferred back to sitting in that audience the first yes. time to do that. Yeah. You're a pin drop when you get yeah. it. Matter of fact, yeah. you might have had a drummer with you the time I saw you do it. The bartender stopped making drinks that time. Come and on. When you were doing wow. that, it was dead silent. Nobody yeah. was moving. And even people back in the office by the bathrooms, nobody was moving. That was all, I don't know if you, I didn't, I never played a song after you did that. Cause I'm sitting there <laughs> standing on the side like, oh no, no, that's. <laughs> it felt like we were getting like, um, instructions you know like i feel yeah. like when i listen to that i'm like i'm getting instructions i gotta wow. figure out how to take this you know what i'm saying i'm like apply yeah. this to my life right now this has been an incredible moment it has been a fun moment um i mean yes i mean like we have nationally renowned journalists we and i just it, just the list the list just continues to go on i mean i don't know if everybody caught like carl is exhibits also exhibits for yeah. um, I just mm -hmm. want to thank you all this has been an incredible conversation I was so really looking forward to it. I'm so glad really that we got I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart personally but also as a representative of the Detroit Historical Society um you all are literally the purveyors and keepers thank of you. Detroit stories thank um you. matter um you all are living um exemplaries of, of our mission and I'm just really grateful to have you on this call so thank you all so very much